What's up, Beer Mile Nation? It's Adam's birthday. Oh, God. <laughs> not not on the date that you're listening to this, but the date that we are recording this, it is Adam's birthday. And yeah. it also happens to be his brother's birthday, too. Yeah, that's how twins work. That is how twins work. Um, yeah, it's been a wild weekend. Uh, a lot of drinking. Found out that when you turn 25, you have multiple day hangovers. So that's been really cool. Was it worth it? Was it worth celebrating the birthday hardcore I, with yeah, the Yeah, I twin? think so. I think so. It's uh, like COVID, you don't really get to like actually slang some beers as often. The weather was nice, so YOLO. Glad you got to have a little fun little get together yeah. with the bro and friends. Yeah, I also, uh, for some of our listeners, dude, a shitload of our listeners liked um, my engagement post, uh, which was kind of funny to see. The other big news, Adam is engaged. I on birthday weekend, dude. Her, <laughs> what, her mom was so pissed that she took like the entire day to call her. So oh, like, she didn't tell I, her right away. I did it in the morning, and then she, we were both like, I, we both had long runs that day. Okay. And then we did like a little mini photo shoot at the at the lake. Oh, and she waited until after that. And then once we got home, she like Facetimed her family. Oh uh, man. But it was funny because like when when they were they were all talking, they were like asking how I did it. And then like previously, like last year, it would have been in in Europe, probably outside of COVID. And then uh, I also had plans to do it in like Grant Park and like in a fucking four string quartet type thing. And it was just like a big pain in the ass. And I was like super hungover in the morning and I was in my underwear. And Jordan Very was about romantic. to, I know it was super romantic and Jordan is about to leave, but she was rifling through my shit to get our hyper ice, um, massage gun before she ran, uh, sponsor us. And she was like digging through all my shit. And I was like, okay, well she might like end up finding the ring because she's digging through stuff. And I was just like, let's see, let's do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so it was done out of necessity. Kind of. The cover was about to be blown. Yeah. The cover was about to be blown. And then. I was like, actually, this is perfect because Jordan would want like we completely staged all of the photos that we took as if it was like, oh, like we this is how we're doing Looks it. Looks like but, a surprise. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And and she would prefer that. Hand, or She said she would prefer that hands down to anything else because she was like, oh, yeah, I got to like pick what we were both wearing and like all this other shit. So, so yeah, it kind of works out. Well, there you go. Beer Mile podcast this week. You get the engagement story from, from birthday boy, Adam. Adam and Jordan, they're going to get married, assuming they don't break up before the wedding. It might happen. Exciting stuff, y'all. Today on the show, we have part two of this, I don't even know, this how to fix track, track and field, this track talk, this uh, behind the scenes of organizing track meets and everything that goes into it. This time around, last week we had on Jesse Williams to Sound Running. This week we have the Trials of Miles guys, Cooper and Dave, as well as Mr. Chris Chavez of Sidious Mag. So Trials of Miles and Chris paired up for the Texas qualifier back in February. Uh, Chris on the announcing commentating piece of it and Dave and Cooper running the event behind the scenes and getting everything organized. They're doing it again, two more times actually. Yeah. Uh, doing it in Kansas City on May 1st, I believe is the date. Yes. Um, and then three weeks later, doing it again in New York City, where Chris is also attempting to break a five minute mile for the first time. Yeah, that's, I feel like it's going to be interesting to see if more people tune in live to see Chris or the pro runners. Five or the pro runners. <laughs> it's, it's probably 50 50. It will 50, be great. great. Cause he's got the edge now. He's got like the, the bachelor, uh, he's got, bachelor he's edge. got bachelor nation nation behind him yeah. uh, or bachelorette nation, whatever you call it. Uh, so yeah, Chris gained some clout with his, uh, David Goggins, 48 uh, miles in 48 hours challenge that he did this past weekend. Yeah, uh, when you're right. listening to this, it's been about a week since he did that, raised over $48,000 for charity. And so Chris talks about that a little bit as well at the beginning of the interview for those that are curious and hearing on hearing how that went. Yeah. So we today we talked to those folks. Uh, we get into some similar details as our conversation with Jesse. Um, definitely some different, I don't know, some different viewpoints or seeing th things through different lenses, uh, especially when it comes to broadcasting models. So stay tuned for that. I thought it was really 
a great kind of counter in some ways to what Jesse told us. Not not that they disagree. I think they, they agree about 90% of things, but but the way they're approaching producing the track meets and or putting on the event is, is they have a little bit different philosophies on it. And so it's, it's great to hear both sides of it and yeah. understand that there are multiple ways to get to the right answer. And everyone kind of has different paths to do it. And, and, and I think they have slightly separate targets, which will probably illustrate in the conversation that we have. But it's interesting to figure out kind of what their goals are for sound running and trials and miles, respectively. Just like we were for the Texas qualifier, we'll be part of the meet in Kansas City. So we've committed, yeah. Adam and I have committed to going down there and doing something similar to what we did at the Texas qualifier, where we... Uh, get to be part of the, the media crew. We'll be down on the infield getting some pre-race interviews, post-race interviews. Uh, athletes will be walking the red carpet again after they win. And Ooh, so, yeah, send us, uh, DM us if you have any ideas or suggestions for additions to the red carpet. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. We're, we're looking for other ideas. If you have unique content or video ideas that you're hoping we could get out of this weekend oh, in yeah. Kansas City, let us, us know. Because besides the besides the typical pre-race, post-race interview, kind of behind the scenes shenanigans type video, you know, what else what else would you like to see? We're gonna have some good access probably to to some top notch athletes. So let us know what you think would be entertaining and we will make sure we get it done. So also if you're in Kansas City, we uh, we're gonna have a pretty tight schedule. I don't know if we'll be able necessarily to meet up, but if you're in Kansas City and yeah. you know, hit us up and we'll see if what we can do, maybe meeting up for a run, meet up for a podcast recording. Yeah. Who and, knows? And keep your eyes out for Trials of Miles announcing. Uh, I know they haven't done it yet, but they are looking at adding fan capacity to this meet. So pay yeah. attention. Keep your eyes out. We might be able to have a few fans in the stadium and it's going to be fun. Just like the Texas qualifier. If you haven't seen some of our videos from that, make sure you're checking it out on Beer Mile Media on YouTube. We... We had a lot of fun. Uh, got a yeah. lot of got to meet a lot of athletes, and also, you know, had had our own shenanigans that we usually do in the background as well. Yeah. Speaking of shenanigans, let's uh, pick out some swag winners. Let's do it. We give away swag every single episode to some generous folks who rate us, review us on Apple Podcasts, give us that five star and a review, and and or are you just sharing the podcast on your Insta story is another way to enter as well. And so some folks to shout out since last episode, we got Paul Gracely, Ian Weaver, Zosia Bolhawk. Hopefully I said that right. Do you think I said that right? I Zosia? Think you're the official pronouncer on, on Zosia the Bolhawk podcast. Ruby Wiles, Cole Pressler, Dan Fournier. Do you think it's Fournier? Uh, I mean, that's probably the OG way to say Dan it. Dan Fournier. All right. So thank you all for giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. We're going to, again, we're going to pick two winners because we're generous here. So the first one, Ruby Wiles, you also sent us a, a great uh, DM on Instagram and gave us some tips, some ideas, some things that you like, some things you want us to improve on. And we really appreciate the feedback. Great to connect with you. So let us know what you want from the beermile.com swag store. Adam, I'll turn it over to you to pick number two. Ooh, I am going to go with Zosia because I I really want to know if you did pronounce your last name right. Perfect. All right. Zosia, hit us up as well. Anything you want from the beermile.com swag store. And if we didn't pick you, you can still be entered again. Just share the podcast on your Insta story. That's an automatic entry. Uh, I think we said that's like two or three entries worth uh, because you're helping us spread the podcast out True. to the people. Yeah. Uh, stick around after the interview. We'll be reviewing our third and final beer from Fifth Ward Brewing Company. This one is the, what do you call this? Burl Brown? Burl Brown. Burl Brown Cinnamus Molasses Brown Ale. So stick the around cinnamus. for that. A, a cinnamus? Cinnamon. A cinnamon molasses brown ale. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even hear it. A cinnamus. <laughs> shout out Shout out to our guy Ryan in uh, Wisconsin for coming through with uh, all the Fifth Ward Brewing Company beers. The first two, some of our top rated beers that we've had yeah. on the show for, for the APA and the, the wheat, the honey saffron wheat. So yeah, we're stoked for that one in the outro. Uh, anything else that we need to plug before then? Um, Oh, I guess I will say, because last episode with, with Jesse Williams, we said to send in voice messages for roasting Adam. 
Mm. Um, but that episode hasn't released yet at the time that we're recording oh, this. Good point. And good so point. just want to call out that we didn't forget about that. We're actually recording this episode that you're hearing right now uh, before we before you even know that you need to be sending us those right. roasts. We're building uh, a buffer at this point. So point being, uh, you can send more roasts if you would like. So True, this is a reminder. This is a reminder to roast Adam. Uh, leave us a voice message on anchor.fm slash beer dash mile dash media. Uh, there's an option there to record yourself and we will include it and we'll roast him live right on the podcast. And if you prefer to just write something and not have your voice be part of it, just DM myself, DM Chris Robertson uh, on Instagram and I'll keep those hidden from Adam that way and we can uh, do it give live. Him, give him a big old roast. Um, so thanks for sending those in y'all and it'll be my turn after that. So we'll, we'll start with Adam here, give him, give him all the roasts that you can, and then uh, we'll switch over to me afterwards. So really excited to give Adam, put him in this place a little bit, see yeah. if he cries. Give me the business. He, yeah, see if I crack. See if his ego is just completely ruined afterwards or not. <laughs> but all right. I think that's pretty much it. We still don't have an advertiser for the show. If you want to sponsor the show out there, hit us up. I mean, we're going to get you in front of a lot of listeners. So would love to work with anyone who wants to advertise anything. Um, yeah. Especially if, if you are in, you know, like the, the hub industry, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you have a vibrating plastics uh, industry, section in your section in your store, in yeah. your store. do you think it is, is uh, Spencer gifts? Is That's universal, right? Oh, Spencers. Yeah. yeah Spencers. Yeah. Spencers are in malls throughout the U.S., I think. Sponsor us. Yeah, we would love to do Spencers. That'd be tight. It'd be fun to just like demonstrate some gag gifts right here <laughs> right in front of us. <laughs> All right. Enough with the shenanigans. Here is our interview with Chris, Dave, and Cooper. Welcome to the show, Dave Cooper and Chris. Uh, Chris is a repeat guest. We had him on a couple months back talking about Sidious Mag, uh, but welcoming the Trials and Miles guys, Dave and Cooper, to the show here as well. So could each of you let our listeners hear your voice tied to your name so that they know who's speaking uh, throughout this podcast? Sure, I'll, I'll get things started. Uh, my name is Dave Alfano, um, Cooper's partner with Trials of Miles. And uh, yeah, we're, we're excited about... Uh, everything that's coming up. And I'm Cooper Knowlton and I am the other, the other half of trials of miles. Although now there's, now we have sort of a third member. So there's now three of us. I'm Chris Chavez. Uh, I wonder if people even remember what my voice sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> they should. Yeah. Very, very unknown voice in the sport of track and field there, Chris. Uh, how about give our listeners a quick Chris Chavez. I think a lot of people have been following you on Instagram. You just did the David Goggins challenge, 48 miles in 48 hours and raised a boatload of money. So yeah, give give our listeners a quick update on how we're feeling and how much money that you raised as a part of that. Yeah. So this crazy idea to do, I've never done anything more than a marathon. And so this crazy idea to run 48 miles in 48 hours came about uh, a couple months back on a long run with uh, Zach Clark, who people might know as the winner of the most recent season of uh, The Bachelorette. Um, he and I connected back last fall over just sort of like the guy loves running. And so uh, we have a mutual friend. And so you know, all the running world is so small that we made this sort of action. He's been doing some workouts with me over the past couple months and trying to get this guy to, you know, follow the top end of the sport and, and educate him on, on it. So he was like, well, if I'm doing all these track workouts and, and stuff with that, you guys have to do something that really pushes yourself. And like, cause he's more of like the, the endurance ultra sort of minded. He's never done like a hundred miles or anything like this. So he's like, this sounds interesting to me. I've always wanted to do this. So you know, we, we decided to do it and, uh, gave ourselves like about a month and a half to really prep for it, which we really didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, this weekend was a, a lot of fun. Um, we, I think all the smiles and like the, the, in all the photos that came out from the weekend, make it look like it was really easy, but it wasn't there. It was, uh, the sleep deprivation really plays a role in it. I think in my head, I'm telling myself that, Running 48 miles straight probably would have been easier than what we what we did because um, yeah it's just sort of that start and stop and waiting around um, but I think in those periods of like waiting around 
you know, we're doing this to raise money for the Release Recovery Foundation, which is a nonprofit that Zach and uh, his uh, partner Justin started. Um, and it just, you know, the goal is to, you know, be able to create scholarships for people who uh, need, uh, can't really afford to seek, you know, help for, you know, substance abuse and, and addiction. And so, because, you know, finding that sort of help can be really expensive sometimes. And, you know, he knows it firsthand through his experience that he has shared on national TV. And so, um, yeah, throughout the weekend, I guess those three hour blocks between legs uh, were just, you know, I got to meet so many different people uh, who either work for the charity or have been uh, a part of like the recovery treatment centers. And so hearing some of those stories firsthand and then, you know, receiving some messages of how substance abuse and addiction has impacted a lot of people uh, was really sort of eye opening for me because you just don't really grasp the large scope of, of uh, how, you know, big this, this issue is. And so uh, to fundraise, you know, more than $50,000 was awesome. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not as tired as I thought I would be, and I'm ready to get back to some, uh, track workouts by, uh, maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Cause, uh, next up is this trials and miles, mile <laughs> showdown in, 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 on May 21st. So a weird thing to throw in sort of like the, the training block, but, um, hopefully I'll see some, uh, strength benefits from it too. Definitely. How, how many donuts did you consume in the 48 hours? It, every picture I saw, it seemed like you guys are just hitting up the donut stand. Yeah. So at 3 a.m. each time there's a Krispy Kreme in Times Square that uh, is open 24 hours and we made sure to hit it on the 3 a.m. leg because there's just something really cool and, and uh, about running through Times Square at hours where you presume there weren't, you know, too many people. But nowadays, like it's getting back to a little bit of how weird that area was and kind of uh, not necessarily dangerous, but sketchy uh, in the 80s. And so like it's, you know, it, it was cleaned up i'm assuming like in the 90s early 2000s and so uh yeah it, it wasn't as as like nice and quiet as we thought that experience would be but we did stop for donuts on the way back um in the middle of the leg and so uh i would say i think i consumed it was something like four uh in in the time span so not as many as you maybe would have thought <laughs> but uh, it was it was good i i don't think i lost much weight from the whole thing, which is something that I thought it was going to happen. Not that I have very much to lose. It. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a good experience. And so how is the preparation then coming for the couple of meets that are coming up? Uh, Trials of Miles, Sidious Mag, Collab. How, how are preparations coming? Are you guys in scramble mode at this point or feeling pretty confident in where you're at with uh, with getting everything pulled together? Um, yeah, I think I think overall we feel we feel good about where we're at. Um, I think Kansas City, uh, people who are listening to this, Kansas City, we're, we're just under three weeks out from Kansas City. Um, I think we've got really good fields, like, you know, top to bottom, every race we're, we're excited about. Um, you know, I think, I think it'll be a little bit different than the Texas qualifier. And, and we sort of knew that coming in, like, you know, it was the, the, the Texas qualifier sort of came about in an odd way and there weren't a ton of races on the schedule. And, um, you know, I think, I think the, some of the top tier pros have a lot of options and are kind of very particular about traveling and getting ready for the trials. And, um, so, you know, we, we might not have like, you know, a, a Emma Coburn coming back. Um, but top to bottom, we have people who are, you know, at the top of the sport and we have, you know, we've been releasing names. We have people who are chasing Olympic standards, people who are chasing trial standards, um, some, some definitely some recognizable names in the sport, especially in the steeple. Um, the hurdle races are coming together as well. Dave is kind of the, the person who spends all the time doing that, um, kind of organizing the field so he can speak more to that, but we're excited about, about the races. We're excited to have Chris and Kyle coming back. We are, um, the drone is coming back. The, the production, the same production team that we worked with last time we're working with. So I think that the, the, the quality of the production is going to be just as good. If not, if not better, we have, I think maybe even more cameras. We're excited to have like stuff around the steeple. Um, I think that, I think the content that's going to come out of it, you know, I was actually going through the live stream a couple of days ago and I, I think it was good, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement. So I think, I think that the production value is going to be even better. I think we'll, we'll put out a, a, a cooler product, a, a kind of more polished product. I think Chris will be more prepared than he was last time. I'm expecting, <laughs> 100 to 150 pages of notes this time. Um, 
so overall, overall, we're excited. I think, I think it's, it's coming together really well. And, and, and it's, it's bizarre that people, you know, are still signing up and will sign up until two days before, you know, like people, people, you, you would expect that people's race plans are, are set in stone, but they're not. So, you know, I think, I think that there will continue to be fluidity in the fields and, um, but we're amped. Yeah. We're, we're super excited. Yeah, de- definitely know Chris is the guy that's underprepared for, for pretty much everything he does. I, I, that's how I would characterize him as well. I feel like the when you said, like, how how is preparation and training coming along for this whole entire thing? It's like, yeah, I mean, there's training for the, the second one. But before that, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be technically be on vacation the week before. But for me, what that's going to consist of is just being in front of a laptop a bunch of the time and maybe on a beach, uh, just pulling bios on, on all these people, where they went to college, what I've you know been able to observe from sort of Instagram. And so bring in, bring in the A game again, I think, hopefully to the, to the broadcast. Yeah, absolutely. Dave, maybe you can throw out some of right now, the, the top names, top athletes who are committed and um, just to give sort of people a flavor of the fields. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, well, this, this meet kind of started real quick steeplechasers all around the country were reaching out and there weren't opportunities for obvious reasons. Most of the steeple pits are at like collegiate facilities and private ones. So it all started with like really getting the most of the best steeplers in this country. And, uh, so like in the steeple races, there's like 30 or 40 deep for men. There's, I think there's something around 35 that have broken 850. And for women, there's something like 25 to 30 that have broken 10. So, um, this is all, this is all off the dome. I don't have any paper in front of me, but just from doing this, um, in the, in the men's steeple, you know, you got two time Olympian Don Cabral, you have Mason Furlick, who's really, really fit. You have, uh, Zach Seddon, he's running 21. You got a bunch of guys in the eight twenties, a bunch of international guys. Um, there's a John Gaze running 29, um, Brian Schrader's running 829. Um, and then for female, you got a few that have run 930. Uh, I don't know necessarily in the, you know, in the steeper world, if, if people are going to be like primed and ready to run super quick, but you never know, especially a guy like Furlick who's been racing well. So, um, so the steeple fields are awesome, but what's, what's even more exciting is being able to combine some of these distance races with some of these hurdle races. Like we have two time Olympian, uh, as you probably saw Chris post recently, Don Harper Nelson, who's, I mean, she, she ran a couple decent races, um, recently. So you can't really count someone like that out. And then we just got a commitment from Jared Eaton, who uh, is the silver medalist from 2018 indoors. Um, so the the hurdle fields every day keep growing and, and we're excited to see uh, how that looks. It's a little bit of a different format, three rounds guaranteed to make it to that second round. Um, so it's kind of like the European format with you can get like a little bit of like a practice race before you do your semis and finals. But um, but those two races alone are, are, are really exciting. And I don't want to, I don't want to talk forever, but have some fast 800s, have some fast 1500s, have some fast 5Ks, have an elite high school race with a couple surprise announcements coming up. So yeah, it's going to be fun. Looking back on the Texas qualifier meet, I think one, one interesting thing as a spectator and, and fan of track and field that's kind of come out of the COVID and pandemic is a little bit of a shift in maybe the format and, and especially the way you guys are doing it, where it's free streamed on YouTube, uh, being able to, anyone can, t- can tune in, watch it live. And that's kind of a shift from, uh, some of the previous programming that's more, you know, around the big, big companies putting it on, like maybe it's available on certain channels on TV, but also hard to get to, or hard to subscribe. Uh, you have to have the right cable package or you have to buy a specific subscription subscription in order to access it. And so maybe talk a little bit about the strategy there. And, uh, if, if the live stream was as successful or more successful than what you were envisioning it to be going into that Texas qualifier meet. Um, sure. I, I can, I can start and maybe Chris or Dave can, can finish my thoughts maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, we the, the the idea initially came about because we we did we worked with Chris on like a very small track meet in Jersey City six months ago um, that no big brands were ever going to be interested in, um, and it was kind of like the first track meet in the New York area, and we had you know people like Ali Kiefer and Don Cabral ran it, but it was mostly kind of the sub elite New York um, community, and they came out and we we put it we you know we we didn't spend that much money on the live stream team and we put it on YouTube and we're like pretty surprised. I think over the course of the night, we had like 6,000, 7,000 people tune in, you know, at, at one point there was like close to a thousand people watching. And, 
um, I think we were just, you know, surprised by how many people tuned in and how many people sort of were interested. And, and, and then when we kind of had this idea for the, the kind of sub elite Austin qualifier, we, we, we just sort of thought like, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of like had nothing to lose. So I think we, Chris and I, and Dave had, had had a number of conversations about sort of like wanting to try this and, um, seeing if we could make it work, uh, as, as sort of fans of the sport, we felt like there was a place for it. I think, you know, we continue to believe there's a place for, you know, flow track and runner space and, um, st- having stuff on NBC. But I think, I think like our stuff is, you know, it, it's mostly distance, distance centric and, um, it's pretty niche. And I, we sort of thought like, let's just see what happens. Let's, let's try and put it out there and see if we can sponsor some of these races and try a little bit of a different model and see if it works. And, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're, I think, I think, like you said, like the pandemic sort of allows people to, uh, has allowed people to experiment and try different things. And, um, I think we, we were sort of like, let's see if this works. What do we have to lose? I mean, it's not, it's not like, you know, it, it, it to, to bring in a good production team is not exorbitantly expensive. It's expensive, but, um, there was a, there was a, there was a path to do it. Um, and so we tried it and I think, I think overall the, the reception was great. I think people were, were stoked about it. So we were, we were happy and obviously we're, we're doubling down on it the next time around. So I think that, that kind of tells you how we, how we felt about it. So I'm yeah. Interested. You, you mentioned, uh, sponsoring the races. So at the Austin qualifier, we saw a lot of smaller brands, um, than is typical for an event like that sponsor, uh, single races. What, do you kind of think of that going forward? Do you think that's going to become more of the norm? Is that like sustainable or, or are we going to see a shift back to larger brands in like a, a quote unquote post COVID era? Um, I think, I think it's obviously, you know, I, in, in full transparency, it would be easier for us to have one big brand who sponsored everything, right? Working with one brand is easier than, you know, having to find 10 to 15 people who want to, or smaller brands who want to get involved. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I certainly think like, you know, for this next race, like we are, you know, Heartbreak, um, Heartbreak Hill Running Company, they, they are kind of our main sponsor now. We, we have kind of a, partnership with them. So they're, they're kind of our main sponsor and and we will still though sponsor some of the races. I, you know, I, I, I fully think that like, you know, I'm, I'm very used to hearing, you know, your podcasts and Chris's podcasts and, and there's ads on them, right? Like ads are, ads are everywhere. Um, I, I'm used to it. I don't really care that much. I, I skip ahead. I, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not that big a deal. Um, and I think people are fine. You know, if people are, people are happy with, you know, I, I, I think, people prefer a podcast that's free with ads as opposed to a podcast that's behind a paywall that doesn't have ads. Right. So, um, I, I, I think, I, I don't think that people really cared that we had a lot of ads and we will have probably more ads in Kansas city because it helps us to, to fund the whole thing. So, you know, there's, there's also something really fun about doing an ad read for something like Pat price mortgage, which ended up being like a <laughs> real big hit within like the, uh, the comment section, it's like people all of a sudden were just like, yeah, let's go, like, let's go Pat Price, way to go Pat Price. And <laughs> even though, like these people maybe weren't in anywhere near like the Raleigh area. Uh, it kind of just went to show that, you know, these are, there are genuinely lots of track and field fans out there who are willing to go that extra mile or dig into their pocket to contribute to the sport. So uh, yeah, those were, those were a lot of fun uh, to integrate within, within the broadcast. And it seems like the uh, it seems like the sponsors are pretty happy. And, and actually, to piggyback off what Chris said, Morgan McDonald just put out a video, and he he promoted uh, it was a, like a delivery service, a delivery. Uh, I don't know if you guys recently saw that, but they got me for a month's worth of stuff just because like it just feels so right to something I need and and to support uh, someone else in the running brand. So um, I think we saw a lot of that with the, with the eight to 10, um, hopefully Pat price, if he's watching, he got, he got a customer or two out of it, but, um, yeah, just very, very, very supportive community. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it was fair. Like it was because the advertisements were not typical that people like every single one of them, like caught people's attention in one way or another. So it was really interesting to watch. Um, yeah. I kind of like, so I guess in, in recent news, like watching the masters, both getting hyped for really good production quality, but also like seeing all the players with different logos, um, branded everywhere, uh, whether it's on their gear, clothing, whatever, 
Um, I saw an interesting tweet from Scott Fauble who said, "Like, oh, I'm glad we're I'm glad we're keeping the sport of running pure and not doing that because I wouldn't want like a half million dollar paycheck or something like that." <laughs> what What do you think? Like, as event sponsors, what do you think your role should be? And in, in uh, obviously, you have to drive sponsorships to cover your costs as an event sponsor. But then there's also the aspect of like. So you, you also prize money to draw in athletes, but then from the other side of it, the the athletes are limited in that they're uh, taking in the, the basically they just have their shoe sponsor and they're not able to take on additional uh, sponsors as a part of that. Where do you think that they're like the opportunity like really exists for improvement or where the responsibility should lie kind of on on where where a sponsor would be best serve like would it be better to go through and have athletes be sponsored um by more brands and have them really kind of be the the owners of a sponsorship versus an event or do you think that this model of the event acquiring a, a sponsor or several sponsors is is the maybe the most sustainable way going forward for us um i think it's a really interesting tricky question that i could talk about for a really long time. I, I have a lot of thoughts. I, I, I think I, I've said this to Chris and Dave and they're going to be I, 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 like, I, I think the model of, um, you know, the, 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 uh, what was it? The Nike project Two, the breaking two and the, what the Hoka did with like Jim Wamsley's, um, whatever the hundred K world record. Like, I think that type of model is the model that I'm, I, I think is the most sustainable model, right? I think what Hoka did where, where you basically, it's a Hoka production and Hoka can highlight their athletes and they can bring in other athletes too and put on a really cool event. Like I would love to have a brand who wants to sponsor this whole event and throw a lot of money at it. And they have athletes who can, you know, we can create a ton of videos for those athletes and those athletes can be interviewed before and after. And I, I think, I think that is, you know, on the event side of things, that's what kind of excites me is to be like, look, you know, I, whatever shoe company, like we're going to put on this event and you're going to get a ton of value because your athletes are going to be profiled and, and your pro we can talk about your product and we can sort of like, it, it's a, it's a well-produced commercial. I mean, right. Like these are well-produced commercials. And I think, I think that's a way to, to really sort of make the money work and, and to elevate the athletes and to sort of have it be like a, you know, the, the ecosystem is kind of, it's like a symbiotic relationship between everyone. Um, that's kind of the idea, the, the direction that I'd like to go, but um, I don't know. I, I think, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I think, I think certainly like, you know, sponsors are a necessary, they're a necessary evil, if you want to call it that, right? Like they, they pay the bills, they make these things work. Um, so you want to do it. You want to try and find ways to make it like work for everyone and feel natural and, and elevate the brand, elevate the athlete, elevate the the sport, right. All at the same time and not have it, not have it feel like they're sort of like right now, sometimes it often feels like, like we're all sort of like fighting against each other, like the athletes and the events that they're all, we're all sort of like fighting over this, like these little for, for the same scraps of money. Um, I don't know. Chris, I'm sure has a lot of thoughts as well. <laughs> Yeah, I missed. I, I my internet kicked out for a sec. What what was uh, the initial? Question? <laughs> Just take a guess at what the question was. <laughs> no, we're t talking about like the the sp like at the sponsorship level, like the what your thoughts are on the best path forward between because the 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 athletes are limited in that they have the shoe sponsor. Um, but they're not able to get another sponsorship and, and wear that logo on themselves or tattoo that on themselves. And uh, and then from the event side, you like event organizers, if it's an independent meet, you know, that's not like you like uh, Cooper just mentioned, like put on by Hoka or Nike themselves. But if it's a, you know, a standard track meet, it's on the organizers to make sure that they're getting enough sponsorship to be able to cover their costs of, of putting on the meet. And so just from like a sustainability standpoint and and also kind of talking to what you just said, Cooper, around like at the Texas qualifier, you uh, didn't have that central uh, that central company or group, you know, managing the content. You kind of let it be free reign among independent content producers uh, to help tell the story and hype up the meet and then, you know, have post race uh, content as well. So uh, like what does that ideal scenario look like? If you if you could have your way with with it, Chris, like what does that ideal model look like going forward? That's going to be kind of best for all parties involved. 
it'd be nice if there was like a billionaire out there who really, really loved Trek and would just, you know, hand over the, uh, the blank check and then let us, you know, kind of run free with these ideas. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's so complicated on the athlete side. Like I wish sort of these uniforms maybe looked a little bit more like a NASCAR uniform with multiple, you know, brands. Um, I think we are going to start to see a little bit more, uh, a few, a couple athletes maybe try and break that mold. I'm thinking, you know, someone like a Colleen Quigley, uh, who is yet to like announce who her main sponsor is going to be understanding sort of like her worth as an athlete, maybe signing with a non-traditional apparel company, which still allows her to, uh, sign a, you know, eyewear, uh, contract and a shoe contract and then just all these other sort of like, you know, whether accessories, you know, that, that play a role in sort of like their training. So, uh, I'm interested to see just sort of what she kind of does. And, and it's, it's been, we're starting to see, it's not, she's not just going to be a groundbreaker in that sense. Uh, like I think we'll, we've started to see some other athletes do that o- over the course of, uh, the past couple of years on the event side of things. Yeah. Um, you know, as fun as it was, like going back to just doing those ad reads for those little small sponsors, um, yeah, it, it, it is a thing behind the scenes to try and, you know, touch base with everyone and say like, hey, what's your ad read? What's your logo? Uh, how do you want us to do this? And that just kind of adds up and takes up more time that goes into sort of like the big preparation behind the scenes. Um, and so that could obviously get easier. And, you know, the accessibility thing is is a big, you know, point of discussion when it comes to sort of, uh, you know, w- this, I guess, the model and what we kind of did. Um for me personally, like I, one of the reasons why I decided to, to work with Cooper and Dave was because, uh, for, for me, I got into the sport just based off of stumbling upon a live stream link back in 2012. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've, I've told the story on the broadcast and, and multiple other times, but I was hooked on seeing sort of the, the energy and, and the passion that some of these athletes expressed on, on a flow track live stream that was just, it had the chat box and everything. Like it was very sort of, it was the early days of how they used to do it. And, um, you know, I, I love that, but then I started, you know, over the years started to think like, what are some of the obstacles keeping other people from being able to do that recently, at least. And it's sort of like, nowadays it felt like everything was sort of, you would either hit, you know, the, I don't have the NBC gold, you know, package. Cause it's, it was like 70 bucks. Um, you know, the, I, I have no idea what, what flow track and runner space charge a year, but those are, it all adds up. And, you know, I even think of it, soccer fans, have the same exact problem and there are things that uh, it should be behind a paywall like uh, you know because you know it's i'm not one of those people who believes that everything needs to sort of be free um but i think you know you could offer up a couple really sh- cool events or, or or premium offerings to occasionally you know try and draw in those those people and so kind of that's where I see sort of we come in like it's it's been overwhelming to also receive sort of like the the emails and 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 text messages from people. It's like, hey, uh, would you come out and do, would Sidious Mag be interested in doing this meet this weekend and that kind of stuff? And it's from like race directors trying to, you know, push their event forward a little bit and get some more eyeballs. But I, uh, you know, it's not something I want to do every single weekend. I will, if I can focus on doing four big events a year for free and offer it up to as many people as possible, that's, I think, what I would love to sort of envision doing. And so, yeah, uh, you know, it, I, I, I would pony up, you know, eight or 10 bucks for a subscription to watch like the Big East, you know, conference championship um, uh, behind a paywall because, you know, that money goes to sort of probably, it, it just makes sort of sense, you know, a conference championship, I'd be more than happy to tune into Pen relays, maybe also it's, it's the biggest event sort of in the sport, but maybe you have a little window where it's free for someone to watch. Um, so there's many different ways of going about it. And, um, I think we've kind of, you know, scratched the surface a little bit on just some, a different way of, of, of doing things. Yeah. One, one thing that we touched on in the last episode, um, <clears throat> the pay-per-view model. So I'm interested to hear your three thoughts on, that versus some sort of subscription model, how, how you think that would, would fare? I'll just, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I personally don't have any, any issue paying Cooper and I paid to watch the marathon project. We had friends running it. Um, I definitely pay to watch pen relays. 
I think it's the I think it's the not canceling your subscription part that gets most people, and that's where like some of the frustrations come in, at least for me, because maybe I need to be a little bit better organized and have set my reminder. But um, definitely, if there was an option to pay like a one time fee, this has been tossed around many times before. Uh, there there there'd be no issues, and I agree with these guys. Where like I don't think everything has to be um, free to watch, but. Um, it just has to be maybe a little bit more convenient, uh, for, and I, and I think you'd see a lot of people, you know, five bucks, no problem. I, I think, I think we have to do more to like make the sport more exciting before we can, before we can do that. Right. Like, I, I, I think that if we're like, if we have, uh, you know, like if, if you know that the, the 1500 that we, that we thought that we were going to have a couple months ago, if we know that we're, that we're going to get that right. If you're going to get the, the five best guys in the world and they're going head to head and we can hype it up for a month and it is going to be on an awesome track and the production value is going to be awesome. And there's a ton of prize money. Like if, if we can create that product, um, then like, hell yeah, I think, I think people will pay and, and, and tune in. And, and I think like maybe in two years we could, we could get to a point where we, where we know that we're going to do that. I mean, it's really hard to do that right now. It's really hard to create like when, when you, when you turn in for a pay-per-view fight or a pay-per-view like UFC fight, you know, Colin McGregor is going to be at that fight. You know who he's going against. I don't, I, I can put on a meet for you in two weeks and I can tell you that, you know, that X, Y, and Z are all going to be there. And then two or three may scratch and two or three may decide to go to a different race and the fields are going to get like, like Olympic trials. Hell yeah. Like Olympic trials, I'd pay a ton of money to watch it because you know, it's the best, you know, the stakes are high, but for the most part, you, you, we, we need to make sure that the product is like the, the product has to drive the pay-per-view before right now. I just don't think there are that many things. Like I think the marathon project was a rare thing that I was like amped to pay for. And I tuned in and, you know, like there, there, there are rare events that come, I, I mean, the Olympic trials, like the marathon trials, like those are events where I would pay a ton of money. They are already pay-per-view they're, they're, they're like required watching, but Beyond that, it's really even as a as a event creator, it's really hard for me to imagine a situation where unless you can like guarantee me the ten best athletes, I, I would I would feel I'd have a hard time like hyping it up and chart making people pay money for it. It really is like a chicken or egg thing of like you almost you almost need enough prize money at your event because then athletes will gravitate towards it and it's you're gonna have more confidence that they'll actually show up. But then in order to get that prize money, you need that big sponsor or you need to have a pay-per-view model that you you know is going to work ahead of time somehow. Right. Uh, and it's really hard to predict what sort of revenue you're going to be able to bring in on, on the pay-per-view or the subscription or whatever it is ahead of time in order to know how much you can pay in prize money. Um, and, and that was one thing that I thought was, you know, kind of interesting or clever approach from like sound running on how like crowdsourcing the, the prize purse. Um, so that at least there's, you know, something there, but that still doesn't really solve the problem of, getting the athletes to commit ahead of time because they don't know what that price purse is going to be anyway and whether it's worth, you know, committing to. And, and at the end of the day, it, it's so much, the shoe sponsorships are so driven towards the Olympics and the Olympics being the one event that matters and nothing else truly matters as long as you do well, like, as long as you make the Olympic team, essentially, that's the, that is the main driver of your career. And so it, it is a really, it's tough to know what the first step should be in order to kind of solve that, that overall puzzle. But, but I think maybe what Colleen Quigley is doing, if she is able to get a sponsorship that isn't just based on the Olympic cycle and that is outside of the typical shoe contract, that could be kind of a stepping stone in that direction where she doesn't have to put all of her eggs in the Olympic basket and, and bank on that happening solely. Yeah, there's this brainstorm over here that's kind of knocking out the internet. But I wanted to make one quick point sort of about like that pay-per-view model, which was, you know, when I took a deep dive, because I'm a big numbers junkie as well when it comes to sort of like an audience, you know, development sort of uh, thing and looking at things, the audience that we captured for the Texas qualifier was heavily in that 18 or yeah, like 18 to 34 crowd. But there, I mean, I also kind of see it as, there was a lot of young kids in there too, just based off the like high school kids and, and just based off just kind of the comments that were being dropped in there. Um, and so where the pay wall, uh, the, the pay-per-view model comes into to play is like, do I really kind of think that like a 
15 year old, 16 year old kid is going to have that credit card handy to be able to pay for it. We would have just undercut so many more of those potential viewers. Um, even in, in thinking about it from like a college perspective, uh, I don't have to be crowded around the same sort of TV in our living room. Uh, to watch this. I could have been in my room watching the meet. You know, my roommate could have been in a different room watching the meet. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the pay-per-view model is is sort of an option, but I think kind of going back to sort of, you know, the Cooper's point about the athletes sometimes pulling out and stuff, that's just kind of the way the sport, uh, it's, <laughs> to put it, uh, to use the cliche, it's that's how the cookie crumbles. And like, I think Kyle has even sort of mentioned it it mentioned it during the Texas qualifier broadcast where it's like, we may have been expecting to see like this diamond league caliber men's 1500 field. Uh, but things happen. And that's just kind of like the problem that, uh, the sport has with storytelling. Same things. When I had Grant Fisher on my podcast, he admitted, he was like, the Bowerman crew is very flaky when it comes to sort of these meets thing. Jerry likes things being the perfect way in order for them to compete. So while it isn't great in the grand scheme of things for, um, for, fans and for the viewers like they you have to pick and choose your battles am i going to prioritize racing and times and 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 the olymp and making the olympics or you know do i do this for you know the good of the sport so again just another weird thing that this this sport has to find a way to to balance i'm i'm curious you mentioned uh finding like a billionaire with a blank check uh as a as like a thought experiment if i gave you a bank loan of $5 million and I wanted you in three years time to make that money back. What are like the top things that you would change or start doing? Oh man. Money back. <laughs> Uber, I'll let you go first. Ooh, you, you can <laughs> the event. We, we like, can talk structures of the deal. Maybe, maybe the valuation of my investment has to be at least double. It's tricky. It's tricky. I mean, look, I, I think the main thing that I would do kind of along the, the same lines of what we're what we're talking about is if you gave me a million dollars, five million dollars, like I, I really do believe that, you know, we are we are putting on meets that I feel really I, I'm like excited about and I I feel like proud of. And um, but we're you know, we're, we're operating on a shoestring budget, right? Like we're we're giving a little bit of athlete assistance. We're giving you know, most of it's going into the production. Most of it's going paying for pacers facility. Like we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're not making any money off of this, right? Like, you know, full, full, full candor, right? We're, if we, if we break even, we, you know, have a little bit of money in the bank account after these, like, great. We're, we're doing this because we're, we're passionate about this. This is not, this, these are not money-making endeavors. Um, uh, if you gave me though, like a million dollars and you were like, pump it into this, like I would, I, I think there's a way to pump it into a meet where there's a ton of prize money and the production value is extremely high and you get all the, you know, you, you, you get the top athletes and you create, you know, you create stories and you get all the content creators there and you get like, you know, you, you have that, you know, whatever, whatever it is that the trials and the, you know, like these, these rare events, the, the kind of energy around that. Um, to get all those people there and to have, you know, the, the, all the eyeballs in one place for, you know, one weekend and just a ton of excitement. And there is there, you know, there, there, the, the brands get value out of that, right? Like you, you the, the brand athletes, when they come and they perform well, and you know, the, the, like the, the only way the, the, it, a, a shoe company is paying an athlete because they want to have them get exposure and right. And, and have high school kids around the country, see them wearing their, their gear. And so then they sell more, more stuff. So like to create one or two, like just the, the, the hot, super high caliber events where like, I would love to, you know, the, the events that what, what we're really trying to focus on right now with Kansas city is like, all right, well, what, what can, what can we control? We might not be able to get the Bowerman athletes because the Bowerman athletes have a very specific schedule and they don't want to travel like all those things which are totally fair it's an olympic year but like what we can do is we can make our weekend like a super fun we're going to have like a race dj we're going to have a drone we're going to have like you know we're, we're trying to do like all these things like let's just make our event like as as exciting as fun as different get as many eyeballs on it as possible but if we had money to like add prize money and make sure that like everyone comes and the production's even better and we can do more storytelling and um, I, I think these events are, are cool as they are, but if you like injected not even that much money, like they, they, they would be so much cooler. And, um, I, I, I do believe that there's, there are brands that would really benefit from that. Um, that just the whole sport would benefit from that. 
uh, and I don't, but I don't know if that would, if that would make you any money. <laughs> and, and the other thing too, sort of, again, kind of going back to the little brainstorm sesh that Merber and I had on my podcast, like a couple months back, it was sort of like, it just doesn't have to happen at like a new event. Um, the, the marathon project was wildly successful, uh, but it came as a result of the circumstances where it's like, it was, uh, it's a race opportunity for people to run really fast, get those contract bonuses or even land a contract. And um, Texas qualifier doesn't seem like it would be an annual thing. Uh, it just so happened that like, we need to, you know, try and create these opportunities for athletes to qualify for the Olympic trials as a result of a limitation of, of meets due to the pandemic. So, uh, it's, it's interesting to see that we don't, we could take that sort of money and just, and it's, it's crazy to think that the, the, that amount of money is already like, if we wanted to do this to like the pen relays and the Drake relays, as Merber said, these are the, you know, the biggest events outside of the trials for, uh, you know, United States, you know, running and, uh, Nike used to sponsor the pen relays and they have, you know, that sort of like, uh, that, that, that money to, to kind of toss around. So finding a way to make those, but at the same time, you, when you look at a track meet, it's run the same exact way as it was sort of like in, in the seventies, you turn on an NBA game, it wasn't it, from the seventies. It's not the same exact product that's being offered to the fans nowadays. So it's like, what can it, the halftime em- entertainment, the entertainment between timeouts and that kind of stuff. If you go to one an NBA game, it's totally different than, than what decades ago was being done. And if you look at a track meet, it's just still event after event, event after event. And, you know, it, there needs to be a way to not only try and capture a cup, like a handful of new fans by offering something really cool, but enhancing that experience for the audience that the sport already has. So I'll, I'll also add the Texas qualifier off that limited budget. Granted the fact that we had, we did have some big names. There was a, there was a massive following and Chris, Chris probably has the updated metrics, but between the videos that he posted and chopped up and the actual two of, Friday and Saturdays, you're looking at five, six, 700,000 views, probably 50 to 70 unique followers. And if you look through some of the comments, there's one that I like, can't stop forgetting. Cause I thought, I thought it was so powerful. It was a father. And he goes, my high school age daughter sat through the entire meet, watched the entire thing. She hates watching track meet. And, and like a, a girl like that might go out and start running a little bit more. And that girl might be the next Colleen Quigley or Emma Coburn. And, and so I would, I would guess that we had a lot of new followers from people branching off and with a little bit more money and having consistent fields like that and like enhanced production and great announcers. Um, I, I don't see a reason why those numbers don't continue to double or triple. And that's when, that's when sponsors are, are even happier, of course, because you can, you can pull those metrics out and they go, Oh my God. You, re- you really do have a lot of eyeballs on this thing. So plus all the, all the stuff that Cooper added to make the experience even better. So, yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting point uh, just around how track and field, at least the production hasn't really changed. And something that we saw that was super successful with uh, the Texas qualifiers with uh, Chris and Kyle announcing was like, I mean, we, we just had uh, like a, a record breaking race. Um, that literally the announcer was like reading off of Wikipedia. And I was like, this is what the sport has to offer. Really? Like we just had a free stream that was better quality, had better announcers, albeit no, uh, no like national records, but um, I don't know. It's just, it's just something interesting to me that that's something that hasn't really been played with as much. As I would have. The conspiracy theory that was floating around out there about the uh, that that video clip that that I shared uh, after the Mac Fleet tweet is that it was purposely a uh, really bad announcing job to bring awareness to the event uh, and the, the record that was set. So that's just you know if you're a conspiracy theorist putting on your tinfoil hat like that's <laughs> um, you know I, I don't know what the final numbers were on the number of views that that little clip got, but everyone's now going to know about the 2021 Istanbul half marathon as a result of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the commentary is is huge, right? And I think it's 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 huge. Like 
you know, I listen to a lot of like sports podcasts and, um, you know, Bill Simmons was recently talking about how they think that like, uh, in, in five years, you're going to listen to an NBA game and you're going to be able to have like your choice of like 10 different commentating teams based on, you know, your individual likes. And, and, and I think that's, that's the way it's all going. Like people want to be able to watch their friend. And I think like, Chris is sort of like a friend to all of us in the running community because we're used to listening to him. And, and that's part of why it was so successful. Cause it's like listening to Chris's podcast. It's like, you know, and, and we know Kyle and, you know, I think, I think that is um, the, the, the commentary teams need to be uh, it, it's a huge part of the viewing experience. Um, and I, I was think- hoping my April fool's prank would have manifested into to a real thing at the same time. I didn't want to, piss anyone off. Uh, but, uh, maybe I think NBC landed, you know, a handful or one or two Peacock subscriptions as a result. Probably. We were, we were hoping, we were hoping to manifest our, uh, our April fool's jokes as well, but still waiting for those to land, uh, <laughs> waiting patiently. The, the, the NBC thing though, like, I mean, you put it out as a joke, but why wouldn't NBC do that? Like why, I mean, what's, why would they not have, how, how much could it cost them to have Chris and Kyle essentially on a separate YouTube feed or, or something like that on a different channel? Like they already have the the footage and, and you're going to get more people tuning in, more people excited. Like it, it's not that complicated. Right, especially with, with the level of, or the amount of people that you have as a following. I mean, basically the entire sport knows, knows who you are and is like down for you to commentate on things. So very curious as, as to why NBC didn't bring you on for that. Uh, well, the, the little behind the scenes, can I tell you, I'll tell you guys a little behind the scenes of how the whole prank came together. I, I mean, I thought about it, but, um, the press release in and of itself was very much a, I thought the fact that, um, when a- ABC and ESPN put on like the college football playoff, they do, they blow it up. They make it the biggest thing that's on their network for that night. And they offer up one, a feed with just the regular commentators. One is just a feed that is just the sounds from the stadium with no commentators. Another one is just co- other coaches watching the same thing and giving their sort of commentary. Uh, another one could be just celebrities or notable people from the sports world or sports like who are big sports fans or like super fans of those teams competing, talking about it. And then another one could, is it, it was just like, so I took, I looked at an ESPN press release from that same, exa- from that when they announced that they are going to have these offerings. And I looked at, and I just kind of, you know, tweaked around a couple words here and there. And I was like, This is it. Like, it's not a groundbreaking idea. ESPN does this all the time. NBC shells out billions of dollars for the Olympics and and the Olympic trials. So let's see how believable this thing is. Take the same language that they do when they announce that they have the office on Peacock and and just, you know, chuck it in at the very bottom of it. And there you go. That was that was that was the prank. Then I had Kyle Klasinski, the uh, Sidious Mac graphics guy, just, you know, dock up a couple little graphics to make it look really believable and and unfortunately i think we fooled too many people and got some hopes up and led to a little bit of heartbreak (laughs) (laughs) i think um that like the the exploration into the broadcasting world or like different different ways that you can put on the events is really interesting kind of going back to the masters just because it's on top of my brain um like yes last night I, i was watching i watched like a single player's feed every single shot uh, in the last round. And I'm curious, like your thoughts on how we translate that to something like running where it is like somewhat difficult to get a continuous shot of a single athlete in a race. Like, what does that look like? Are we just following people around with a camera all day? <laughs> it, it, that could get expensive, right? Just the number of cameras <laughs> putting on people. But you know what? Here, let's let's think a little bit, you know, simpler for something like the Kansas City qualifier, the New York City qualifier. Let's, you know, maybe we'll try our best to try and mic up a coach uh, throughout the whole entire thing. That would be sweet. I mean, that'd be another little added thing where the coach is mic'd up. Flowtrack had a video a couple of years back of, of, of Heps indoors where they mic'd up all the coaches. Somehow they got everyone to, to agree to it. And it made for like a super sick highlight reel. Uh, so, I mean, if we, for example, if On Running shows up to the meet, uh, can we mic up someone like Dathan Ritzenheim for while all his athletes are competing? I, and then just cut away to from, from, you know, have a camera on him during those sort of events. That would be really cool to see. Um, so, uh, 
or might be a thing that comes out post, you know, from, from the race is another good driver. I think that we had from, from, uh, Texas was that we extended the invitation to, you know, guys like you, Ben Crawford, uh, and all these different sort of new age, uh, new generation, sort of like content creators to come and run wild with our events. The, you know, there, don't worry about, you know, ripping stuff from our feed on, on YouTube, take whatever footage you want and, and go crazy with it. You know, I, we, we paid the bill for, for the production. Uh, now take whatever clip and, and, and go crazy with it. And so, uh, I know, there's times when you know a little snippet of a race ends up somewhere and you know someone will hawk in and you know kind of give you that notice and then things are taken down and so it's another just sort of like little limitation granted i know how expensive people pay for these types of things for these rights and and types of things Mm -hmm. that you would be protective of it but you know mlb has that same exact problem where uh if you were to try and tweet out a clip of someone's home run or something like that it gets taken down or like flagged instantly and and I don't know who that's doing any good. Like I want to see if, uh, you know, Giancarlo standing around and judge, you know, home run that goes 500 feet from whoever tweets it out. I really don't care. Like you've got me as a fan and I'm invested in sort of that, that athlete or that team as a result. So, you know, it, it, there's all these little obstacles, you know, that, that get in the way sometimes. Yeah. We, we debated this with uh, Jesse Williams quite a bit actually on the, like the, like, should everything be free? And like you, like you say, you're, so kind of the strategy here is the more eyeballs, the better, because it grows the pot, it grows the mm-hmm. sport. But then I, the other flip side of that would be, you know, especially you talk about like, this is none of your full-time jobs. You're, you're doing all this basically kind of out of the, you know, your love for the sport and you're really not making money on it. And so would it, would it actually help the sport be more sustainable if you did treat it, I guess, more as a business and kind of like, say like a flow track where they're, they're able to give access to all of these meets that, you know, a decade ago, you couldn't get access to because they have created a business model that works. It's sustainable for them to take in subscription money that they can then reinvest in production. Now I would say flow tracks shortcoming, at least, you know, from, from the, from my perspective for as far as like growing the sport as a whole is that that money then doesn't get into the athletes pockets. It, it's just that they're getting, they're taking in money and, and it's helping them produce events. And so at least it's bringing the the viewership or the ability to view, to view events in many cases, um, you know, maybe some barriers there, but not necessarily getting the athletes pockets, which is, you know, how you uh, probably, you know, drive up more storylines and, and hype around events. But uh, I'm curious on that side though, like, it, if you all were to take this as a full-time thing and maybe treat it more like a business, like, could you, do you see that as that, as a pathway to get to the point where then uh, you are able to reach a much bigger audience and, and have more prize money and, and all of these things can kind of iterate as a part of it. It's a multi-loaded question. <laughs> um, it, is, it is. There, there were several questions in there in reality. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, well, I'll let you I, I was just going to say, I just think, I think flow track gets, a, is get, kind of getting a lot of hate uh, today. I'd say, you know, a lot of track fans throw it hate for like, I, why is this behind a paywall? Like this is bull crap. Like it's not going to help us grow the sport. And, you know, I think there's a lot of truth in that, but I think the debate on the other side of that would be, how do you expect it to be sustainable for track meets to be streamed out so that people can actually see them if, there isn't someone taking on that financial risk, investing in the production crews, investing in the infrastructure, the website, and you know they you have to you have to make it a sustainable business in order to have it last longer term as well. I I think I, I, like I don't think it's it's ever an either or right. I I I think you know Chris alluded to this earlier. Like I think they both there's there's space for both of them. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the big high profile events shouldn't be behind paywalls because we, we do want to broaden the pool of people who are watching and we want to make sure that those stories get amplified. And, um, but yeah, there's, there's a million track meets happening every single weekend. And like some of those track meets, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense for those organizers to bring in a production team that's going to cost them. 10 to 20 grand, right? And that's 10 to 20 grand that they could just take off their line item, give to FlowTrack, give to Runner Space, have a team who's a pro who can come in there and 
you know, do, do the whole thing kind of soup to nuts. I, I think, I think there, there's, there's room for both. Um, I think there's room for, you know, we, we haven't, we didn't make money off the Texas qualifier. Like I, I said that earlier, but that was also the first time that we've done something like this, right? Like, I, I don't think that the first time, you know, Jesse's put on a couple like awesome races and I, I have no doubt that he's like learned a lot from those experiences and will do things differently and will be more profitable a year, two years. If he keeps doing this, like it's not, um, we're, we're, these, these things take time to figure out. And I think, I think there is a model that we can do, you know, we're, I, I'm never going to be trials and miles is never going to be doing a, a race every single weekend. Right. We might do four races in, in 2022. We might do less races, right. Because the, the calendar's back, there might be two big trials and miles races in 2022. And I think those races will be different. And I think there's probably a path that we can, we can make those sustainable by selling ads and hyping them up and doing things the way that we like to do them. Um, and maybe that model works for us, but it's, it's not a, and it's not a flow track model, but flow track then does the other, you know, 800 meets that are happening around the country. And I think that's, that's awesome because it's great when you are a, you know, when, when you're competing in, you know, some, some smaller meet in, in a, you know, wouldn't normally get, have a production team there for your friends and family and fans of the sport to, to see those things. And God forbid you get some crazy result. It, it's all captured there. Um, I think it, I think it's both. What, what do you think are, if, if anything at all, are you going to do differently uh, after some of your uh, previous meets for Kansas city? Yeah, well, I'm running one of them. So that'll be a little bit different. Um, <laughs> just running as hard as I can for hopefully uh, four minutes and 59 seconds. And then immediately making my way up the stairs at uh, Icon Stadium to do Carried, some, carried up you know, the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> leaving it all out Chris, there. Chris, welcome. <laughs> yeah. So that, that'll be um, different. Um, you know, there was... I was honestly nervous before the start of the Texas qualifier because, you know, I've been, I've been on the other end of things too, just sort of like uh, the, there's, you know, there's something that goes wrong with the time system or a camera is not working or the, the stream drops out for a bit. Um, and to, the fact that it went so smoothly for those, those two days um, was really just a tremendous, you know, relief off my shoulders where, all the prep that I did do beforehand, um, was worth it. Uh, and I think like, there's not too much that I think will be changed up. Maybe we have, I think a couple more guests like in the booth, uh, this time around, because when Morgan McDonald and Mac fleet came along, that was a lot of fun, uh, to have them, uh, commentate as well. Um, I am going to put in the same amount of preparation into it. I think I have to familiarize, familiarize myself with calling a hurdles race, I think a little bit better because I'm not, uh, I used to be a sprinter, but uh, I never hurdled. And so seeing how, just how fast those, you know, 13 seconds or so uh, go by and being able to, see, you know, judge who's leading by the second or third hurdle is something that I'm going to, that the Kyle and I are going to have to learn or, or maybe have a guest commentator help us with that kind of stuff. Um, but aside from that, you know, I'm just excited that Mark, the drone guy is going to be back and, and, and working, working his magic. That's, I know a lot of people have been asking, uh, for that. So, so we'll, we'll have that. There's, the excitement levels for this. I want this to again, be something that people mark their calendars for, you know, May 1st and May 21st tune in on those Friday nights, you know, crack open a cold one, invite your friends over, uh, do things safely. Um, and just make a whole night out of it. You know, th these are going to, it's not going to be a two day event for, for these this time around. It's just going to be, you know, a good, you know, three, four, five hour, you know, window of, of really solid racing. And so, um, I'm just super excited for it to, to, to be here. Dan yeah. Cooper, anything else? Go ahead, Dave. Oh, let's see. No. I mean, look, having hurdle races is, is going to be sick. Hurdle races and high-level steeple races. Uh, we have a few guests that we'll announce soon that are from the Kansas City area that if you've been following the, the running and distance world for the last few years, you, you've heard of them. Um, Kieran Olinear is going to come, and he's going to DJ this meet, which is going to be so cool. Um, I'm waiting to hear back 
about spectators. So this would be potentially the first meet where we can actually have some spectators, which will be fun, which is another, another thing we didn't chat about with how to make money, um, potentially with these meets, but, um, we'll have an elite high school race in between the, uh, the pro races, which is fun to give that community a little bit of a, you know, there's a couple high schoolers that are doing a great job with like their YouTube stuff and getting themselves out there. So, uh, excited to announce some of them that are coming. Um, yeah, the, the entries look really good. It should be a really fun four or five hour meet. Definitely. So, so is what is Kiran's DJing? Is that both live for the people there and on the live stream or is it just one or the other? We're, we're going to figure that out. <laughs> I, think, I think it'll be, I think it'll be both. I think, I think we want it to be both aspirationally. It will be, it will, it will be both. I think we want it to, we want him to be uh, bringing some vibes to the athletes on the track, but we also think it'll be a fun thing to, you know, speaking of like having guests pop in and doing things like we we're, we're really trying to make this, like we want this to be uh, an event that you tune into and you're like, you know, it, it it's, it's kind of the, like what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially, yeah, especially a Saturday evening track meet. I think the the DJ vibes could be good for the people at home as well. So they can have have both the party scenario or party uh, theme as well as the track meet all in one. That's kind yeah, of, we're, we're going to, we're going to continue to try and do things differently. And we've got a couple other ideas that we're, we're playing with and seeing if we can make them work. And I cannot guarantee you that they'll all work. Some of them might fall flat and, it happens. Um, but we're going to keep, keep pushing the envelope and excited to see you guys and excited to have you guys. Hopefully you're bringing the, bringing the red carpet back. We are red carpet. We'll be back. Uh, we have a few additions. I think. Yeah. Maybe some additions. We'll come up with something else clever. Um, also invested in a nice camera this time around. So we're, we're up and from the, the iPhone game to the, uh, and GoPros to an actual camera. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's awesome. I, we're really excited to be a part of it. And I think also seeing, what was so cool for us was that was the first time we've been at a professional meet and like been on the infield kind of as a part of it. You don't even realize how insanely athletic all of these people are. And then adding in now the sprints and the hurdling piece and steeple. And that's going to be a cool component, you know, selfishly for us to see, but then also I think that'll add a lot to the, to the meet and building on the product that you put together last meet. I think, 99% 99% of what people said was that it was, you know, top notch and, and super well done. And uh, I think you'll just by default have a lot more viewers that do market on their calendar because there was such a good experience last time that they have no reason, uh, you know, but to tune in and, and know that they're going to get a good event again this time around. It will be, it will be a fun event. We're excited to have you guys there. And and we should, I want to touch base with you guys again about the trying to do something on Friday night. I think it would be fun to have a, Heck yeah. a, uh, figure out a way to have you guys maybe do an interview or two and have Chris and Kyle record their podcast and maybe have some people come out for that. If we can do it in a safe way. Yeah, for Heck sure. Yeah. Let's, let's uh, hang on here for a second and, and talk about that if you can, but uh, anything else you want to close out with any words of wisdom for our listeners, anything else you want to plug uh, with the race? When's the, uh, when's the West fly beer mile going down? Oh boy. Well, do you know what would be fun is if that could be part of a Charles and Miles uh, event. <laughs> I would love it. I would. <laughs> Everett, if you're listening, we will we'll, we'll bring you to Kansas City. <laughs> I mean, New Everett, York. <laughs> Everett, if you want to if you want to do it, then I will happily do it then. And I, my offer still stands. These are all these are all at college campuses, so we'll have to finish the meet and then find some find some. Uh, it'll be, yeah, <laughs> it'll have to be off track. No offer still stands that I'll, I'll put up 2K to race him and happy to do it whenever, wherever it's, it's up to him, whether Ooh. he wants to take on that risk during season or not. I love it. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> man. We just yeah. gotta, we just gotta give uh, Mark the drone guy a few couple hundred so he can come film that one afterwards. <laughs> Heck yeah. Drone. Yeah. That'd, that'd be fun. No, I've never actually no, there. I've, I have seen one beer mile recorded on a drone, but that, yeah, that would up the production for sure. No, I think there could be a lot of hype around that if, if he will, commit to setting a date with me, but I mean, I, that would go perfectly with Chris's, Chris's sub five race, you know, pair it, pair it with that, like oh, two true. back-to-back events that are like, you know, not your, not your typical pro running races, but just other entertainment, like kind of like halftime show type events to go along with it, I think would be good for oh, the production. Yeah, should, I'll, I'll text Sinclair, see if she's coming to any of the yeah. upcoming and races. And you can do your race. He's yeah. got, he also has a bet with Sinclair on, they want, they're going to race a 400 and see who can win in a 400. So <laughs> just all the, all these little side races and side <laughs> bets that we have going in the sport. I love it. Chris is bringing on half the cast of the bachelor. We're bringing on just, <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing it all. <laughs> I love it. All right, guys. Well, this was super fun. Thanks so much for having us.
Yeah. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Shout out to Dave, Chris, and Cooper for coming on the podcast. It was great to get another perspective on what it takes to coordinate these these crazy track meets. I mean, just thinking through like the number of things that go into it. It's like you got to coordinate <sighs> all of these agents, coaches, and athletes, and that it's just evolving. Like every day, a new a new athlete wants in, an athlete wants out across twenty different events, yeah. and then you got to worry about sponsors, production, facilities, insurance. Everyone sending in their their negative COVID, COVID tests, tests, like travel. Comp, it's unreal, like, and the fact that these guys are doing it uh, not as their full time thing, just as their you know their passion outside of their full time things, is just makes it that much more impressive. So great to get their perspectives on everything. Super um, excited to be down in Kansas City. Yep. And yeah, uh, we'll we'll see if we make it to New York. Probably not. But yeah, uh, definitely I, streaming yeah. Chris's Rafes live, uh, regardless. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll see about New York one meet at a time here. But Kansas City again, if you're in the area, DM us. We might be able to see see if we can meet up for a run, meet up for a beer, meet up for a podcast. Who knows? Uh, we're we're still figuring out our schedule, so we'll we'll adapt and try to accommodate whatever we can. So I, I think what I really liked about. And hopefully let us know, let us know out there if you liked this two-parter kind of on the, the business side of track and field, yeah, how to make the sport better, what you think. And, and give us in the comments, if you're on YouTube, let us know what you think. Like what would, what would be, what, what would you want to see event organizers focus on to really grow the sport? Like do, are you in favor of the free model? Do you think that there's a different way to do it that we didn't even talk about with Jesse yeah. or, or as Chris well as like what, you know, what type of production content you'd like to see the running world expand or, or change into. I would be interested to, to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. We, again, going into this conversation, we thought that maybe we would have some like debate or kind of some counterpoints against what uh, sound running said. So we kind of tried to like, uh, what's the word? juxtapose some of their ideas. I yeah, we, we tried to kind of sneak in some of those items that would be like topic for debate around the different business models and, sure. and whatnot. And, you know, they had great answers. It's it's I think there's a lot of different ways that we could grow this sport and get it to where, you know, anyone who's a big fan of it would really like to see it go. Right. Um, and, I, and I think the the major thing that uh, both set of folks have in common is that they're just trying. They, I think they have very similar priorities in terms of um, providing opportunities to athletes, making sure that the production and, and visibility of the race is outstanding. And then f like, you know, bottom of the totem pole is actually putting cash into their pockets. It's a yeah. priority, but, but I think both of them can agree that, that they want to boost the other pieces first and that that's what makes me optimistic about the sport is that you have people like jesse like charles and miles like you know, dave and cooper like chris that are doing it for the good of the sport first right and profit you know last and and so knowing that those are the type of people that are kind of leading the charge definitely give it gives optimism for the future i'd say definitely let's get into this beer review so cinnamon molasses brown ale i really don't have any sort of expectations for this i don't I, I don't really have a bar for this type of beer it's a unique one for so sure let's see how it goes i guess so cinnamon and then molasses so kind of like maybe a little sweet Sy a little yeah is it do you say syrup or syrup uh maple syrup syrup so you're a syrup guy okay syrup are you i'm are a you? i'm a syrup guy okay versus syrup Syrup. Like S I R R U P, syrup. Syrup. I know people say that. Now, I say syrup would be the correct pronunciation, I believe. Depends. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Oh, it smells amazing. That's pretty good. That's really good. That is really good. I'm actually, actually, that's a style of beer I don't think we've had yet is wow. the. Uh, like a nut brown ale and we haven't really had any brown ales and that's actually one of the types of beer that I, I really do like on that's more kind of on the heavier ish side yeah. it's not obviously not a stout reporter but oh it's it's the like brown dark. ales are something that I, that I really enjoy that are a little yeah the dark it's dark but it's not like as heavy as like a get yeah, right. it's like a Guinness right. I'd say and so yeah I'm actually surprised after all these times we haven't really had that yet on the show wow that's that's pretty damn good Let's do oh, let's wow. do taste out of ten. Wow, I'm gonna give it a nine. I'm gonna give it a ten. 
That is that's amazing. That's, this is a good this is a good fall beer. Is what I would say. Yeah, it's I a wanna little be, I it's a be little like out of a, place right now. Sure. Just in that it's like kind of like summer vibes, you know, not necessarily is, like a brown ale. I think a brown ale. I think like fall. Yeah, I want to I want to be on like a, a picnic bench, um, maybe by a fire. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This tastes really good though. Do you taste the? I, I thought it would be a little more cinnamony. Yeah, I'm not really. I'm not really tasting the cinnamon a bunch. Not that that's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but I guess a hint. You, you, hmm. you probably don't want anything to be so overpowering that it. That that's can't all really, you think about. Yeah, I can't really s smell the cinnamon either. But for sure, like a little syrupy and a little nutty. So we got 5.8 percent ABV. Uh, you know, so that plays into the drinkability. I think that's we got that IBU 29. So, you know, not not super low, but also, you know, not super high. I mean, that, that was very descriptive, right? Not super yep. low, not super high. And then the SRM, I, I think I, you know, sounded like an idiot a couple episodes ago. Oh, I was like, what the heck is the what, CRM? What SRM, it's a based on like how it's like the, basically the darkness, the color, the color. Oh. Of the so it's on a scale, you know, like Does that really clearish matter, yellow to dark. Uh, what does that impact? Like nothing? Uh, I think just how it looks like. That that shouldn't but be reported. Let me, let me okay, let me do Beers let me for drinking, not looking at. You heard it here first, SRM does not matter. Literally just a color. That's, this is the first time I've ever seen it on a label, so. But Fifth Ward, I'd say they have this, you know, these unique beers here. So they're kind of catering to the more sophisticated beer drinker. I'd say, yeah. you know, it's it's meant to be unique and a little, little fancier. I feel like if I went on a, like a taste tour, of uh of the brewery it would actually be something that i could tell normally i get a flight of beer and i'm like hmm four of these are taste like wheat beer and they're exactly the same and then you have like their your standard one dark beer yeah but i feel like based on the three beers we've had from here it'd be actually something that has uh some distinctive pours gotta top that bad boy off Good uh, so we said we said basically top notch ratings on the taste Let's what about drinkability. drinkability yeah i'm thinking i'll go with six on drinkability that's kind of what i was thinking too i was gonna go six or seven because it's this taste isn't so strong that you would get completely sick of it after you know half a beer or one beer but it's not it's it's like a two beer kind yeah of thing. For, like, for me it's like it's completely separate from its taste it's more just like the aftertaste i'm kind of like huh i could use some water now like it's it tastes really good but you get what i mean after you could use a palate like, cleanse yeah yeah i feel like i need some fly f some flies some fries or some like poutine or something i don't know Ooh, this brown i don't know what is uh brown ale meant to pair with is it is it poutine is that a very common pairing i think so it might be <laughs> i mean I, like every brewery has it so yeah Okay, so you not yeah, brown ale not not typically intended to be a super drinkable beer, so yeah. I think that's a fair yeah, rating. That's fair. Any any X factors here? Mine is that hmm. it. Mine is that it, I I think a fall, which is normally a good thing, but not so much when it's like summer because I look forward to summer more, and then fall may is maybe my second favorite season. I I kind of want to put this in uh, like I want to make Kodiak cakes with this. Does this uh, this would pair well with Kodiak cakes? That's what I'm saying. If you have Kodiak cakes for dinner and this is your beverage on the side, that's a good That'd pairing. Be money. Which, oh, which flavor Kodiak of Kodiak cake. cakes? Gotta go chocolate chip. Chocolate chip with this, yeah. And and then what? Uh, what's your condiment or dressing? <laughs> dressing uh, on your on your pancake? Are you, are you a bananas, maple syrup guy? Um, or yeah, pe just peanut butter? Like what? What are we going with? I'd, oh, I would I would probably do both. That's, some I'm, some peanut butter, some. Yeah maple syrup uh not syrup and yeah i mean nanners some strawberries yeah random fruit i'm a peanut butter and syrup guy too maybe, so no, maybe no butter a, i'm not really a big butter guy i'm not i'm not butter on pancakes usually either it depends like if it comes with it i usually like i, I let it melt a little bit and then i scoop i scoop, scoop the, off the excess yeah yeah that makes sense god i miss um I miss those diners that are just open forever. Yeah, and, Waffle uh, House. Yeah. I hop. <laughs> God. 
I think the IHOP by us is open 24 seven. I might have to go there someday. We gotta make a 4 a.m. run or 5 a.m. run sometime. We can make some good content there. Just some I, real degenerate there, I shit. mean, there's definitely some people watching to be done too. So even if we True. were degenerate, we wouldn't be the most degenerate people there, at least the one by us, but. True. Man, anything else before we close out? I don't think so. We got, uh, the time you're listening to this, we're hitting up the Drake Relays, and then we're hitting up the Kansas City Qualifier. So just let us know what you'd like to see from a content perspective. If you have any ideas on different types of videos we could do or funny things that we could incorporate into the event and, you know, help make it more exciting. Just if you have let any, us know. any costume ideas, perhaps that too. We Texas, we, you know, put on our Texas cowboy fits and what are we going to do in Kansas City? I don't know. It's still it still is kind of that vibe to some extent, but not. Not enough to where you can like make a thing out of it. Yeah, though. so I don't know. We'll have to see. So it might not be, th our outfits might not be themed on the location. We might just have to go with some random, you know, just True. Some, some outside theme. Yeah, maybe we dress up as like superheroes or something. The possibility. Onesies. That could be good. <laughs> that might actually be really hot. It could be like 80 degrees. Oh shit, City. yeah, good call. So good we might, call. we need to do some minimal clothing. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you. We'll see you in the next episode. Nice. Hey, hey. Good song.